yourself with that tip. Are you hungry for the word? Let's get going. Today, the title is The Devil's Deed. D, the letter D. The Devil's Deed. And that is disobedience and disrespect. What I'm going to be teaching about is with, we're, this, we're dissecting the verse of Timothy 2, I mean 3, 2. We're dissecting the verses. We're dissecting the, dissecting the words. For men will be lovers of themselves, we already talked about that. Lovers of money, we talked about that. Boasters, we talked about that. Proud, we talked about that. Blasphemers, we, we were taught about blasphemers. That was last week. I want you to know that each word, the way he lined it, the way Paul uh, put this verse together to Timothy, or the letter to Timothy, he put every Every word is subsequent. It's, it's subsequential. In other words, the words are, it's, let's say for instance, the lovers of themselves, right? Then the next word is lovers of money. Well, subsequential means that the next verse is connected to lovers of themselves. And then after lovers of money comes the other word, boasters. Now, boasters is connected to lovers of money. Lovers of money is connected to lovers of themselves and boasters. So, each word is connected to the other word. Each word is connected. They're subsequential. They're connected. And then they're connected when they're proceeding, when they come to after. They're all connected. So, what Paul is saying here is that if you have one, you have a little bit of all of them. Because they're all entwined. They're all connected. It's just, if, you know when you're, when you're uh, doing crochet and you do a loop and then you do another loop and then you do a, well, all those loops are connected, right? If you unravel one, they're all going to unravel, right? So these are all words and descriptive words that are connected. So I want you to know that when we speak of one, we're speaking also of the one after and then the one that's going to come, the one that has been said and the one that's coming. Those are all connected. Did, did, did I confuse you enough? <laughs> so everybody understands that? Okay. We learned that these words were subsequential, occurring after and succeeding to each other. In 2 Timothy 3, 2, in the King James Version, Paul used each word to build on the words that follow. Not only follow, but in some way grows out or is closely connected with the words that preceded it, the words that come after it. So, Heavenly Father, I ask the Lord, that as we hear, Father, what your Spirit is telling us, Lord, make us aware, Father, of where we, Lord, fit in this, in this line of words, Lord. And where, Father, you want us to, what you want us to do, Lord. Father God, we are here because we want to know the truth. We are here, Heavenly Father, because we need your leading. We need your guidance. We need you to uh, show us. We need you to go before us. Jesus came. He's gone before us. But now we have to follow him. So, Heavenly Father, for the, us that are following him, Lord, give us insight. Give us illumination of your word. Give us, Father, understanding of your word. Father, we are here. We surrender our hearts to you, our thoughts, our minds. We surrender everything that we are to you. Do as you please with us tonight. Speak to us, each one individually. Each heart, each heart is a different world. Each soul is a different flower, a different scent. So, Heavenly Father, you can speak to all of us at the same time, even though we are different. We give you the glory and the honor. Thank you, thank you, thank you for teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. And say amen, amen. Today we learned. Of, today we're going to learn about the devil's deeds, disrespect, and disobedience in these last days. 
Along with these deeds, we will also touch on the word everyone knows very well, which is the word caring. Are we seeing the evidence of these words in today's age, the ones that we study? I think so. Let's find out. We will start with the rena- with a, with a meaning of the word disobedience. Okay. Next. Okay, disobedience. In Greek, it's, in Greek it's apathy. Uh, who knows Greek? <laughs> it's apathy. 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 And that word is a form of the verb "fail," meaning to persuade or convince. So to put it to put it in an easy form, disobedient means to persuade. I mean, in, in the Greek word, in the Greek word, apathias means to persuade or convince. When an A, now here comes this famous A, everything in the Greek, when you put an A in front of a word, remember what it does? It cancels the effect. In other words, it takes the meaning, uh, the positive meaning, and turns it around and makes it a negative meaning. It takes the, uh, it, it takes, it makes it uh, reverse. It reverses it. Instead of being persuaded or convincible, it is now unpersuadable uncontrollable, inconvincible. In other words, what that means is that it's an unteachable spirit because you can convince it, you can persuade it, you can control it. It's an unteachable spirit. An unteachable spirit normally comes when someone thinks they already heard it all and they know it all. When they think, oh, I already heard that, I don't need to hear it again. Oh, I already, oh, I already know that. Even though they may be sincere in their hearts and think, ah, you know, it's boring. I already hear that. I've heard it over and over. Because of the fact that that's how you're filtering it, you're going to hear it again and it's not going to mean anything. And then you'll hear it again and it's not going to mean anything. Because your spirit, your heart is not open to hear the true meaning. Your heart is not open to receive. You know that we will never, ever, ever get to the point that we know it all in this lifetime or in many other lifetimes. We're never going to get to the point that we're going to say, I've heard it already. I know what it means. No, because you know what? He said that his word was power. He said that his word was life to anyone that found it. So when you hear it, it should bring a di- it should make a difference, and it should bring life to you. If you have an open heart, if you have an open mind to receive, when you come, receive whatever the Holy Spirit has. Don't come in with a mindset that oh here we go again, here we-, because you're not. That's what you're gonna do. That's what you're going to get. What you, what you prepare your heart, that's what you're going to put in. If you come in with a hard heart, how is the seed going to be planted in a hard heart? How, how is it going to be? How is, when we're worshiping, how is that going to cultivate and turn the heart and prepare it? Because that's what worship is all about. When we're worshiping, we're worshiping, and as we're surrendering to Him, our heart is being prepared. It's getting ready so that when the Word comes, it falls on good soil. The, 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 your heart has been prepared, and it falls in there, and it will grasp. And when it grasps, it will go deep, so that when it roots, it will root deep. And, not very, and it won't very easily be taken away from you. So we need, so we need to come with an open heart. We need to um, not come with a closed mind. Um, let's see, I didn't mark my. Uh, so that's an unteachable spirit, meaning the word disobedient no longer could be persuaded, controlled, led, or exercised, or have authority over. 
It describes a loss of control. As they lose control, they also lose the space. When you have someone that cannot be teachable, when you have someone that can, you cannot, that when you talk to them, they are not listening really to what you're saying. They may not be yes and uh huh, but they are. It's not going in. It's not going in. Um, I love to when I teach. I love to see you because I want to see if it's going in or if it's just. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh huh. Just gloss right over. You know, just all right. I could go like this, and you're just. You know, oh, you're asleep on me. You know, <laughs> I can tell when I go, and. <laughs> I'm just kidding, that's, that's never happened. Not yet, anyway. That's why I say, don't bring too much food because they fall asleep when I'm giving the lesson. Right. So, um, they lose respect. When, when, you can't, when you can't persuade them, when you can't convince them, when you can't. When you're telling them, you're instructing them, you know, you, you, know, you, know, you need to do this. Don't go in a different line. Go in the, go in the um, path that God has you. Don't try and do something that you're not. They're not listening. These kind of people are people that they think they know everything, they think they know it all, and they've heard everything. And no matter what you say, no matter how you say it, no matter if you jump up and down the cartwheels or whatever, they're not going to listen because their mind is set on themselves. I know. I know. So they're never going to learn anymore. They become stuck right there, and then they're not growing, and then they say, why did you God hear me? Why, where are you? Where are you? No, it's not where, it's not the question is in, where are you, Lord? The question is, you shut the door to your heart. When your heart started becoming cold, you shut the door to your heart, and it, the, the word can't come in anymore. Now, let's look at the word parent. Um, right. The Greek word uh, for parent is gonias, meaning begetter. You know how Father God begot Jesus and and uh, Moses begot I, Isaac, is it? Or was it Abraham begot, begot Isaac? And um, Jacob begot Moses and all the other 11. So that's what it means. It means a biological parent or anyone entrusted with the responsibility to raise a child to adulthood. So it doesn't have to necessarily be biological. It's anyone who has been given the responsibility to raise a child to adulthood. That is a begetter. That is the word for parent or parent. Parents are, are the plural form of the Greek word, Greek word ganias meaning the begetter or parent. Biological parents are anyone entrusted with a responsibility to raise a child to adulthood. The Apostle Paul prophetically forecast that at the end of the age, the last of the last days, a very unusual period when children would be unpersuadable, uncontrollable, inconvincible, or unable to be led. Do we see that today? I am sure we have witnessed children who won't submit to the leadership of their parents. Parents have a God-given responsibility to raise their children to adulthood. In the last days, children will deny their parents' right to lead them in a very disrespectful way. There's the D word. Why? making decisions for themselves without parental guidance or influence. And some decisions are lives also. Children in many homes, even today, no longer submit or follow the orders or leadership of their mothers and fathers. Of course, there are cases where the parents have lost their children due to their own lifestyles and wrong choices. Uh, 
you know, we say, why is my kid this way? Why don't they listen to me? Why don't they? Have you taken time to make inventory of your life and how you live before them? Because they're not going to go by what you say, by the instructions of what's coming out of your mouth. They're going to go by what they see you doing. Because you could say one thing and you, you do another. And that, guess which one they're going to follow? They're going to follow the, uh, what they see you do. Because you're putting action into that. They're seeing you do something, so that is staying with it. When you talk, I want to tell you something about words. Words are very powerful when you hear them and you let them come in. But yet, at the same time, words, the wind takes them away. At the same time, when you speak and they're not paying attention to you, the words, the wind blows them. There goes your words. They didn't listen. They didn't hear it. What about questions? Why are they losing their kids? They learn by seeing their parents. The key word here is seeing. They can easily detect inconsistency. In other words, do what I say, not what I do. What words do they hear you say about your parents? What words do they hear you say about your parents? Do you say, oh man, my mom this, or my dad this, and my dad this? Guess what? They're picking it up. Or are, you, or, or are you being respectful? Because when you start back talking to your parents, they're going to pick up that disrespectfulness and they're going to do it to you. When you talk that way in front of your kids, what you're telling them is you're saying, it's okay for you to do that. Look, I did it. I'm doing it. Be careful what that you, when you speak about your parents, that you speak respectfully. Because that pleases Father. So be careful with that. Be careful what you do in front of your children. Even better yet, do they see you being obedient to these parents? Because you're telling them, you got to go to Sunday school, you got to do this, and that's not, and, and you got to do this, and God says to do this, and God says to do this, and, and the Word says to do this, and the Word says to do this. But yet, you come from church and you do the opposite. That teaches them church does not matter. That teaches them, you know what, this is all hypocrisy here. So why go if you're going to re- if you don't if you don't do what the supposedly Bible tells you to do? Why do you want me to do it? We have to be careful how we act before our children. That's how we teach them by how we act before them. I wish to God that when my children were even smaller, thank God that I was I was kind of um a little um, strict with them, but I'm glad I was. Because I taught them when they were little. They're big now. They're doing their own thing. I have no control. But even if they're older, guess what? I still speak to them. Because they are my children until the day that daddy takes them home. So I still speak to them. If they don't like it, well, too bad. But I'm not going to stop speaking to them. I still correct them. I still speak them. They think, oh, I'm a, I have tunnel vision, and that's okay. I do. <laughs> that's the truth. I do. I don't want to go there nor there. I want to stay focused. So, so um, the author says, the Holy Spirit is speaking of a more all-encompassing phenomenon that will occur in homes throughout society in the last of the last days. Many parents, instead of leading, listen to this, many parents, instead of leading their children as Father God instructed them to, because he does, he gave us a good uh, lesson in the word, how to raise your children. Uh, many parents, instead of leading their children as Father God instructed them to, they're making deals and negotiating with their children. If you clean your room, 
I'll pay you this much. If you throw the trash, I'll pay you this much. Ladies, they live there. They sleep there. They eat there. They have to contribute. You don't have to pay them nothing. You have to teach them responsibility. Now, if you want them to do something that you're supposed to do, what can you say? Well, this is my job. You know, I'll give you so much if you do it for me just this one time. But don't make it a habit. Because then they're not going to be able to do anything for anyone without making or wanting something in the It's best to just have them learn to do it without expecting anything from you. Because then you don't create a little, um, a little uh, greediness in their lives. Because that makes them greedy. So then they, they don't, they want something in return. You know, when you say, do me a favor, a favor means that you're not going to pay back. You're not going to, you know what I'm saying? If, if I ask Christina, can you do me a favor? Can you do this for me? Can you take me to the store? Oh, sure, if you'll come, I'll take you to the store, and then I pay her for it. That is not a favor. That is more of a, of a, of a, here you go. And though I do that a lot because I, I don't want to take them for granted, and I know it takes gas to go here and it takes gas to go there, so I do that. But truly, really, for a real favor, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Not all the time. Okay. Parents refuse the responsibility of instructing their children it's better to make a deal. They don't want that responsibility. But they, for some reason, we got twisted. Something got twisted. We're, we're not, what happens is that we're not reading the word to tell us how to raise our children. We are listening to the psychiatrists of the world to tell us how to raise our children. We are listening to the school to tell us what to do with our children. No. We listen to the Father who created them, who weaved them in our womb, to tell us what to do with what He weaved. Right? That's what we do. Since we began our study of the last days, all the, all the prophetic verse in, in 2 Timothy 2.3, that's a prophetic verse because he's prophesying what was going to happen in the future. We have seen the characteristics of the last day generation. So far, we've seen that this generation will be lovers of their own self. Society is a self-focused, self-absorbed, self-centered, and selfish society. This issue of lost perpetual, perpetual, or perpetual means never ending or changing. In other words, the loss of something that's fixed. In other words, fixed right. They don't change. Let's say, for instance, the Word of God is unchangeable. It's perpetual. And He gave us instructions, and those instructions should not be changeable. The way the world goes is they give us instructions and they change them every five days. You know, first, oh, well, well, look at just what happened. After that. First, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Get close, don't get close. Being, get injected, oh, wait, no, not that one. You, you know what I'm saying? They're constantly changing, constantly. That's not, that's not, no. The, this issue of lost perpetual rights will continue to escalate as we get closer to the end of the end. We already see parents afraid to discipline the children. They hesitate to spank because the child might bring charges against them. I'm going to tell you something. Spanking is good. It is very, very good. But listen to what I'm saying. Spanking, not beating. The Word of God says, spank your children out of hell. It's in Proverbs. Spank your children out of hell. And let me tell you why. Because if you don't spank them, if they're little, if you don't spank them, even from their, that age, from that little, little beautiful one up back there, if you don't spank them, they grow up to be arrogant, disrespectful. They will not, they will not respect you for anything. Now, again, let me say this. Some children need spanking. Some don't. There are children that are born just, they're just good. 
And there are some children that are born with such a strong will that you have to break that will. And so you each and each child that you have is a different world. It's a different bow. They're bended different. And you have to find where the curve is because if you don't find that curve, you're not going to be able to discipline that child. So you have to work right, um, right, right. Hesitate to spank because of child might bring charges against them. And yes, many children have been and are being abused by the law, by the laws, but the laws are usurping. In other words, they're, they're taking over with no right whatsoever the God-given right of the parents to lead, guide, influence, discipline, and teach their children. The laws are usurping them. God-given. We have a God-given, God gave us that authority for our children. The world system is trying to take that authority away and give us what they think is right for our children. They did not create our children. They did not wo- they did not wove our children in our womb. Father God knew them even before they were woven in the womb. He knew them before the foundation of the earth. Who better knows how to raise that child than the Creator? Why are, why are we swapping? Why are we letting the world system? I mean, the minute you get a letter, well, this is what you should do with your child. Oh, we gotta do this. Oh, oh, I'm gonna take him to the psychiatrist because, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do what they say. And they dope them. They give them medication, medication. The very first thing, and one of the, the things in the medication is suicidal in, 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 in things. Why are we doping them with that? Because why keep them? Uh, keep, we don't want to hassle. I don't want to spank him. I don't want to do this. I don't want to no, take him over here. Just dope him. And, you know? I know I'm over exaggerating, but in some cases I'm not. We need to understand. We need to open our eyes. We need to see what the enemy is doing to our children. Right? And then I lost my story. Oh. I want to tell you a story. And it's a true story. I'm not going to say names, but it's a true story. There was this little girl that was so respectful in school to those in authority. She just, she just knew the elders and she respected them. It was a little girl, but she was very, very respectful. And the teacher couldn't understand why. She had never seen anything like it. Finally, she filed a complaint to the child services. Her reasoning was that the child was so respectful to those in authority because she was being abused at home. She con- concluded that the only reason for that level of respect towards authority had to be fear. It is good to help children in need, but make sure that the need is real before you ask. Children's services step in and forcefully remove the child from their home, and not until a few years later, when the state was convinced that there was no that there was no abuse that they returned the child. Isn't that crazy? All because the teacher could not understand, you know, because the teacher is no longer the teaching, they want to be psychologists. And I'm not talking about all teachers. We've got our excellent teachers. I'm going to look at my herb on here. No, 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 no. No, no. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I'm not talking about all. I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm talking about the young. State. I'm talking about the non-believer teacher. I'm talking about the world. So, my goodness, so much is going on behind the scenes, and now it's all up front, and who cares? 
But this is not what the Holy Spirit was referring to in Second Timothy 3 2. Father God has given us the responsibility of raising our children in the way we should go. And we must exercise that authority according to the Word of God. The Word of God is our authority. It is our instruction for everything pertaining to our life here on earth. Not only for our sake, but for the future generation. Not only for our sake. We cannot sit here. I cannot sit here and say, well, you know, my, my kids have grown, and, you know, I don't have to worry about this. No, I do have to worry. I've got great grandchildren coming. I have a newborn that's two months. No, I cannot. I have to think of the generations that are coming after us. You know, because our grandchildren are going to have children. And those children carry our blood. They are ours. Amen? If they don't carry our blood, they carry our name. But anyway, and if they don't, and we're responsible for their bringing, guess what? We joke with them. Amen? Every child needs training and guidance from his parents. And believe it or not, he desperately craves it. A child wants to be led. A child wants to be taught. A uh, because in doing that, you're showing your children that you love them. You're, cho- you're showing your children that you care for them. How would it be if whatever they wanted to do, you let them do, and whatever, you know, what, how many times I even saw it in some of the kids, some of the friends that my kids brought home with, oh, uh, you would ask your dad, oh, they don't care. They don't care. No, they don't care. You know, because they don't. And, that, and they may, but what their perception that they've gotten is that they think that, they, that the parent doesn't care. Why? Because they're not taught. They're not, they're not you know, A child needs training and guidance from the parent. The law says you can't make your child go to church. Listen to this. You can't make your child go to church. You can't put your faith on him or her. That's infringing on the child's rights. They have the freedom to choose. Hmm. Why do you send your children to school? But why do you send them to school? I'm asking a serious question. Why are you sent? Why? Why do you want them to learn? Why? Oh, is that the why? Because you go to jail? And, and that's the reason why you send them? No. You send them to learn. Why? To learn that two plus two is nine. I mean, four. <laughs> you send them to learn because they need that education for life. You know they need to know that education, to have that education so that they can find a job, so that they can you know, support themselves, you're teaching them so that they can be adults and be what? And be beneficial in the community. That's why it's, it's good for them. So you send them to school, right? Now, do you ask them, Katie, um, are you going to go to school today? Do you feel like going to school today? <laughs> it's your choice. It's your choice. I don't want to infringe in your right. It's your choice. You know what I'm saying? No. You tell her, hey, the alarm goes on. Get up. You know, my husband, all he has to say, that the alarm will go off and he passed by. And my, my husband always said, my kids were raised up and he only spoke once. That's how they were raised. And the alarm went up. I passed by. Get up. Dad passed by. Tell me, get up, boys. Then he, he, they would hear his steps coming back. Oh! Right. Because they were trained since they were little. That daddy only speaks once. And in my house, there was never even once a slamming of a door. Lord forbid, Lord forbid that one of them would stomp and shut the door or slam the door. Woo! No. Because you know how that stopped? Because when they were very, very little, 
and they threw a tantrum and fell on the floor and threw a tantrum, they got spanked. They didn't get beaten, they got spanked. And then we would, we would tell them, before we even spanked the tell because you did this, I'm going to spank you because this is not good. And as they were growing, when they were going to get spanked, my husband would tell me, you know where you're getting spanked, right? Yes. Yes. I told you not to do this, and you did it, right? Yes. And what did I tell you I was going to do as you did it? You were going to spank. Okay. So they would turn around. I would go outside. They would turn around in their little box, and, and Daddy would spank them. Spank them, not beat them. And Mama was outside. <laughs> But I could not interfere. Because if I interfered, I would be undermining my husband's authority as a father to my children. So I could not, I could not interfere. But the thing is, what I'm saying is that what a parent says must come through. In other words, you don't say something and not do it. When you spank, you tell them why. May, or one time, one of my kids did that. I don't remember what he did, but I remember saying, if you were me, and you, you had a little boy, just like you, and your little boy did what you did, what would you do to him? What would you do to him? You tell me, what would you do to him? And we would talk like that. You know, so when you're spanking, whatever you do, never, ever spank your child in anger. Never spank your child in anger because it isn't you spanking your child, it's your anger spanking your child. So please don't. We were not, when I was growing up, we, we didn't get spanked. We got beaten. We got beaten. There was no such thing as child services or child back in those days. Boy, back in those days, I wouldn't have my hair on the side because, boom, come here, you know. We were, that's how we were spanked. We were not spanked uh, just, come here, boom, boom, boom. No, no, the Lord forbid it. You know that my mom would, would let us even, we could even go, oh, and we go, we will go to school with this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we will. No, there's no way, hey, there's no way I was going to, to my mom, are you kidding? All you have to do is look at me, and one one eyebrow would go up, you know. But you know what? I respected her. I knew that what she said, she's gonna do. And then when we were out in town, and she would look at us, and and she would tell us to behave. Oh, I remember one time she behaved, and I said, "Oh, she can't hit me. I'm getting to the people." All she did, no, all she did was she came to me, and she sat down, and she whispered in my ear. And she said, wait till we get home. But when she said that, but when she said that, her two little fingers, <laughs> you know, like, oh, and I said, and I, and then I would get home, but you already did me when we were over there. But I still got stuck. But you know what? It taught me respect. We don't have to beat our children, but we do spank them. And the court says, no, no, no. But Father God says, yes. And he's the one that I listen to. When they're little, don't, don't start doing that when they're 11, when they're 10, 11. No, because all you're going to get back is anger because they're too old. What you do then is you take away what they love the best. You have to hit where it hurts. If, the, if you see that they love these games, take them away. Yeah. But whatever you do, don't don't spank. There's only a, there's a certain age for you spank, and those are when they're very very little, when they have a diaper, take away the diaper. Even if you have to wet your fingers a little bit, don't go. That's all right. I'm, I'm going to tell you what the worst is. You, if you spank them, you're not going to kill them, but you're going to save them. That's what the word says. So, where was I? I know, baby, don't go home and spank your children, please. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. You talk to them. They yeah, uh, talk to them. Talk to them. So, 
Do you give the child the right to decide to go to school? Of course not. Isn't that infringing on their right? We have a God-given responsibility to train our children in our faith. Do you? They, don't, they say you can't tell them to go to church. You can't tell them to uh, go listen to the Word that is going to save their soul for all eternity because you're infringing in your life. But boy, you better send them to school. Because if they don't, they'll come and like they said, they'll arrest you. They'll, they'll, they'll take them away from you. Why? Because you're not giving them the education, but yet they tie your hands. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We have a God-given responsibility. God gave it to us. We take and spend... Okay, I'm sorry. We have a God-given responsibility to train our children in our faith. Here is where we take a stand and say no to the law. Remember, when do we cross? When do we say no to the law? We're going to break the law. You say no to the law when the law is going against your faith, against your faith with God. Then you take a stand. The laws that are, are interfering with our faith fear God rather than man. The Holy Spirit says that the authority of parents will be under attack, and it is. We have given our parental authority to the world and allow them to put their knowledge in the place of the education of God's knowledge. We've allowed the world to train and teach our children instead of us. Because you know what? They don't even, they're not even training them anymore. Before, when I went to school, school we got trained. Uh, they would tell us, you know, what are the proper ways, you know, what are the proper ways, thank you, please, manner, courtesy, respect to the elder. That's out the window. I one time when my kids were little, I went to class, and all the kids were, they were everywhere in class. There was no order whatsoever. Each child was doing whatever they wanted, and the teacher was in the corner with one child. And I said, what is this? It's bad. It's bad. Above the knowledge of God, a slide. In Proverbs 22, 6, and the King James, it tells us, Jesus tells us, God, Father, God tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In the message, it says, point, slide. In the message, it says, point your kid in the right direction. When they're old, they won't be lost. Isn't that me? In the living and the living uh, trans, uh, Bible, teach the child to choose the right path, and when he is older, he will remain upon it. Okay. Today, for the most part, because of the assault against parents' uh, parental authority, many parents are renouncing their authoritative world in the lives of their children. They are giving up. And some are giving up just because it's too hard to deal with, especially if you are the example. In other words, if you're, you're there and you have to get inconvenient to teach your child something, you don't want to inconvenience yourself to teach your child. So you're not, if you're going to be the example, well, you know, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I can't be the example. I would have to stop doing this. I would have to stop doing that. I would have to stop drinking. I would have, uh-uh. I, I, I can't do it. No, nah, can't do it. So they throw in the phone. And they let the child grow whichever way the child wants to go. And that's why so many say, my parent doesn't care. My parent doesn't care. They don't even know where I'm at. So we have to be the example, but that doesn't have to. But that doesn't have to be in the life of the believer. We are His people. We recognize the tricks of the devil. We can see through the disguise as a wolf in sheep's clothing. In John 10:10, 10, 10, in the King James Version, right? 
It says the thief comes not but to steal, kill, to kill, to destroy. I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. In the message version, it says a thief is only there to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that this is to so that I may have, so that I, so that they can have real life, eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed. Isn't that awesome? John 10.10 10 in the easy to read version. A thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I came to give life, life that is full and good. So the thief comes to destroy anything good. But Father God says that he, come, he came and he wants us to teach them because what he gave us to teach them will give them good life. Let me remind you that our Father cannot lie. He means what he says and he says what he means. It, it, it's possible to maintain a solid upper hand in your home while treating your children with tenderness and dignity. It's amazing how they will, in time, in, in any of your behavior, and begin themselves to show honor for honor is due. As you, as a parent, and to your parental authority over them in the home. So you teach them the way they should go, and they will follow your, your example. The characteristics we'll be studied so far are prophetic indicators that the very last of the last days are upon us. Based, based on the scripture and Greek word meanings we have studied thus far, stop look, and look around. Everything that we have described so far is very clearly seen around us. Everything. Everything that we've taught here, we have seen around us. Correct? Be a good cheer. Don't get saddened. Don't throw in the towel. Don't think that it's over. It is not over. Be a good cheer. We are in this world, but not of this world system. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Woo! Turn to your Bible to John 17. John chapter 17. And we're going to start with verse 13. And we're going to read through 17. So it's John chapter 17, verses 13 through 17. And I'm going to read out of the Message Bible. Now, this is Jesus speaking. He's just about to leave earth and return back home to his Father. And Jesus is saying this. He says, he's speaking to his father, and he's telling his father, Now I'm returning to you. I'm saying these things to the world. I'm saying these things in the world hearing so my people can experience my joy completed in them. I gave them your word. This is what Jesus said, okay? He already gave them Father God's word, which is the word of God, the Bible. The godless world hated them because of it, because they didn't join the world's way. So that's the kind the world hates us so much, because we're not with them. Just as I didn't join, Jesus said, just as I didn't join the world's way, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, Father, but you guard them from the evil one. Verse 16 says, they are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. We are no more defined. We, we are no more defined by this world than Jesus was. That's how we're supposed to be. That much different. We're not supposed to blend with the world. We're supposed to be different, set apart, make them holy. What does holy mean? Set apart, consecrated. With what? 
the truth. Make them holy, consecrated with the truth. With the truth of how things really are. And what's the truth? Your word is con- the consecrating truth. So, we are speaking his word. And his word is the consecrating truth. Do you want to know the truth? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something about this, this Bible study here. About this women's ministry. I told you this before and I'm going to repeat it so that you can understand. This women's ministry is not designed for you to come to a club. This is not a, cl- a women's club. This is not for you to come and have fun and pretend that you're a child in school and just do up classes. This is the place where you come, you're serious of the things of the Lord, and you pay attention. Because what is given to you is the Word of God. And if you don't want to take it so lightly, and you don't want to really, then don't come. Because this is not a club. This is not where you come and, oh, we're going to have fun, and we're going to have fun, and let's do this, and let's do that, and we're going to have fun. No. This is a Bible study. This is to prepare you for what's coming. This is to give you the truth. This is for women that are serious in their walk with Christ. This is for women that are serious that for their children and their grandchildren and their homes and their husbands. It is not a game I'm playing here. And, and, and I love it because you women here are serious. Your walk with him is serious. Your hunger after him is serious. Or you wouldn't be here. You'd be somewhere else. But if you, it's, it's like I said many times before, and I'll repeat it again. This is not an ordinary women's ministry. It is not a program. Many women's ministry, that's great. They have, they have, oh, let's do this and let's do that. And, and how can we get the women more excited and have more fun? I'm sorry, this is not your class for that. This class here is for you to learn the Word of God, to know the truth and the true meaning behind it, to awaken you to alert you of why things are happening around you, to alert you of things that are coming so that you won't be frightened or taken off guard. These are things for you to prepare you, to strengthen you, so that you are serious in your marriage, when you're serious in your walk with God, when you're serious with your children, and you love your children enough to say, hey, I've got to change some of this lifestyle that I'm going through. Because I love my children. And I don't want them to go and make the same mistakes that I did. Right? We don't want that to happen. So we are we come here to learn. And that's why Jesus that's why Jesus said, I gave them your word. I gave them your word and the world hates them. Why? Because we take this word serious. And the world hates us because what? They cannot change our minds. They cannot make us turn to their ways. Why? Because we're serious with them. Amen? Amen. Now, let me read it to you in an easier version so you could understand it better. That, I like it in an easier version so I could understand it better. It says, I am coming to you now, Jesus is talking to the Father. I am coming to you now, Father. But I pray these things while I am still in the world. I say all this so that these followers, are we followers? Okay. So that these followers can have the true happiness that I have. What was that true happiness that he had? What was the true happiness that Jesus had? Is it doing the will of the Lord? That's good. What else? What else is the true happiness? 
being one with us. That's it. Being one with Father. His true happiness is knowing the Father. Our true happiness is knowing the Father. I want them to be completely happy. I have given them your teaching. What are you doing here? You're being taught. I'm being taught. You're being taught. And the world has hated them. And they do. Because they don't belong to the world, just as I don't belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I am asking you that you keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to the world, just as I don't belong to the world. Make them ready. Make them, he's asking the Father, make them, the followers, ready for your service through your truth. Your teaching is true. That's verse 17. Make them ready for your service through your truth. Your teaching is true. Wow. Wow. We are blessed that our Heavenly Father has always warned His people whenever a big event is about to happen. He warned Noah but only he, only he, Noah, and his family heeded the warning. He warned Lot, but only Lot and his daughters heeded the warning. The wife did because the wife turned back, looked back. Now he is warning us. Let's heed the warning. Instead of thinking in fear of what is happening in the culture around us, this can be our greatest hour. It really can. It could be our greatest hour if you want it to be, if you take this word seriously. I, I went ahead and um, I got, and I could make copies for you if you want a copy, uh, this about, about um, what the Bible says about children's rights. And, and you're going to be surprised because really the Bible doesn't say very much about children's rights. Let me read it to you. Uh, first, I want to give you the top part. Until the 20th century, little thought was given to the concept of children's rights. Children were basic children were basic being the property of parents, or in some instances, considered little adults and sent to work in factories and on farms. In 1924, the League of Nations adopted the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, and in 1959, the United Nations adopted a similar statement. The UNICEF was established in 1946, and through the years, many attempts have been made by worldwide organizations and individual nations to define and uphold children's rights. The Bible has little to say about children's rights, instead directing instructions to parents about their children's upbringing. It's not about the children. It's about the parents. We need to take back that authority. In Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Instruction. In other words, teach them. Many children's rights are embedded within that command. But its its focus is not on the child but on the parents. God gives parents strong commands about training the children and holds the parent responsible for following those commands. And that's in Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2. And I'm going to read, them, read, it, read it to you in the message. This, this, verse 1, this is the commandment, the rules and regulations that God, your God, commanded me to teach you to live out in the land you're about to cross and to, and to possess. They're going, they were just about to possess the land, but he needed to give them instruction. This is so that you live in deep reverence before God lifelong, observing all his rules and regulations that I am commanding you. You and your children and your grandchildren living good, long lives. So he's commanding, he's teaching us 
so that we can teach our children, so that they can teach their children. And it's all the Word of God. It is unchanging. It doesn't flip back and forth, back and forth to each generation. It's the same thing for every generation. Even when children grow up, God expects them to set boundaries when it is within their power to do so. He wants them to wants us to set boundaries even when it's in our power to do so. He's not only talking to little children. He's talking about us with our adult children. In First Samuel three thirteen, he says, "I'm letting you know that if that time's up, he was upset. He was he was going to do something here. I'm bringing judgment on his family for good. He knew." This is, he was talking about the priest uh, where his two adult children were having a lot of, doing a lot of stuff that they weren't supposed to be doing in the temple. You, remember, you know that? You all know that. You all know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, he didn't, never told them anything. He never corrected them. He never told them, hey, stop doing that. You're just, you're, you, you are um, disrespecting the temple. Don't do that. He never did. He, went at, he just left them alone. Because why? Well, they're adults. You know, I'm not, I can't tell them anymore because they're already old. They're going their own way. I can't tell them. No, I'm sorry. You tell them anyway. They're still going to do If they do it, fine. If they don't, well, but you at least follow God. You followed his instructions. He knew what was going on, that his sons were desecrating God's name and God's place. And he did nothing to stop them. God rebuked Eli the priest because his adult sons were wicked and making a mockery of God's house. Eli knew about it, but did not restrain them. So it doesn't matter what the age they're in. Although the idea of children's rights being legally protected guarantees some good, the reality can be disastrous. If children's rights include the right to not be disciplined, then disgrace and dishonor are around the bend. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but the child left to himself brings shame to his mother. That's in Proverbs 29, 15. Many children's rights advocates want those rights to supersede the right of parents to train up a child in the way he should go. Proverbs 22, 6. Most children's rights declarations tread on the God-given parental rights, infringing on the parents' right to discipline as they see fit. Give religious instruction in accordance, listen to this, in accordance with conscience, and even educate the child that the that it educate the child the way they believe is right for the child. You have to. You, it, it's he's your child. They're your children. Cases abound in which a court, on behalf of a minor child, has punished parents for not supporting transgender surgery, hormone therapy, or other mutilating procedures for a young child, declaring the child's right to self-determination. While every human being must be treated with dignity and respect as someone created in God's image. Special rights pertaining only to children should be viewed with caution. You do what God. You're not going to be your children. You're not going to be your children. You do what God instructs you to do in your heart for the child that you know very well. Because you know your own child. You know their likes and dislikes. You know their behavior. You know when something's bothering them when it's not. Right? Instead of special rights, children are giving instruction. There's the difference. In the given rights are giving instruction in the Bible. God commands children to honor your father and your mother. But it doesn't say honor your father and your mother because they're good. It doesn't say honor your father and your mother because they're Christian. Honor your father and your mother because, you know, that's a good thing. No, it's a command. Honor your father and your mother, period. Period. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So remember when I said that he told them to, 
follow, follow the, his commands so that they can possess the land? Well, these commands we need to follow so that we can possess our land. In other words, the, in other words, your realm, your world, your home, your work, your, that's what it is. If you want to persist that, follow what he's saying, you follow his instructions. In Exodus 20, 12. In Ephesians 1, 6, and again in Colossians 3, 20, you will see that. Children are told to, to, told to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. We should know that abuse of any kind is never implied and condoned in any ritual mandate. So if you follow those, the ways of the Lord, you're not going to be doing anything wrong. Since God created the family and entrusted children to parents, He knows best how to raise them. In Psalms 127, 3, it says, Behold, children are inherited. They're a legacy from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Did you know that? He says, Behold, Children are a heritage. They are a legacy from our Lord. Wow. The fruit of the womb is a reward. So if we don't take care of that, what are we saying here? We don't want your reward. No. I don't care how old your kids are or your grandchildren are. You be a good example for them. You don't throw in the towel. You don't, you speak to them. Even if they think you're meddling, even if they think whatever, it's okay. You, when you see Father face to face, there's nothing that he can say, look at what you did wrong. Look at what I sent you and look at what you did with it. Why? Because you gave it all you have. Just give it all you have, but make sure that it comes with the word. So God created a family and his perfect children to parents. He knows best how to raise them. When children are reared with obedient spirits and taught to honor parents, they also become better adults, except under extreme circumstances. It is the parent, not the state, who should be accountable for children. God gives children to moms and dads, not the government, regardless of how well-intentioned the court system may be. Children do not usually know or prefer what is in their best interest. Neither is it always within the parent's ability to provide these rights, depending upon the particular children's rights document. Children may be given rights that are not possible. For example, a widow in Sudan, now go look at her that, Sudan, has lost her home and parents may be unable to provide her children with the right to a balanced meal and a comfortable bed. She is then break is, is she then breaking the law by giving them bread crust while they sleep on the floor? How far does this enforcement of these children's rights laws go? Those are questions worthy of serious consideration when attempting to draft legislation that guarantees every child certain rights apart from the parents. The Bible does not seem to support any such legislation, and instead, God's Word counsels moms and dads to take their parental responsibility seriously, as God holds them accountable for their children's well-being. Father God holds us accountable for our children's well-being. So let's take care of them when they need to, so that we don't have to struggle so much when they do. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Did we learn something tonight? Is there any questions? Yes. Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2. Okay. Amen. Any questions? None? No questions? Okie dokie. Well, you got fed a little bit, you snacked, and you got fed spiritually. Thank you so much, and bring a friend that is serious for the things of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mm-hmm.